Our scripture lesson today will be a little bit different. We're actually going to use an affirmation of faith from Romans 8, 35, 37 through 39. You may remain seated, but I ask you, this way it gives you a chance to participate in the scripture reading. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution or famine, or nakedness or peril or the sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now before I get into a whole lot of trouble this morning, I, I, I just want a show of hands. I know I'm far north, way north from my hometown. How many here are Cub fans? Okay. Okay. How many White Sox fans? Oh, good. We got a few, so we got a mixed mixed congregation. Right? Any Cardinal fans besides me? Oh, oh, good. I feel like I'm at home now. Oh, good, good. You, you must have moved up from the south somewhere, huh? Uh, but uh, well, good. Well, I feel a little bit more at home then, and I, because I, I already looked to see where the exit door was out the back. I know there's an exit here and an exit there, so I always check those things out first. Well, let me. Let me tie in a story that really comes out of the St. Louis Cardinals and for me, but it's, it has a lot to do with, as I, as I realized, it has a lot to do with my whole faith journey. I want to talk about my faith journey today, and, and this text that we just read and shared together as an affirmation of faith has been the, the bedrock of my faith. Even when I didn't realize it, it was the bedrock of my faith. Now, I'm a huge Cardinal fan. I, I've been around, as you can guess, almost 66 years. And I have to admit, I have been in all three of the baseball stadiums in St. Louis. Sportsman's Park, Bush Stadium, and then Bush Stadium, too. Uh, people of the church I retired from said I probably had the birds on the bat tattooed on my chest. Well, if I wasn't afraid of needles, I probably would have. I want to go back and share one story today about, about my beloved Cardinals. Uh, you'll probably remember this, especially the Cardinal fans will. It was game six of the 2011 World Series. My wife and I were there. The first five innings, if you go back and look at that game, it was kind of terrible. There were several errors. I think there were three errors on both sides between the Cardinals and three with the Texas Rangers before the fifth inning. It was worse than a Little League baseball game. It was kind of depressing to think these were the two teams in the World Series. But if you remember, as the game progressed, there were several times the Cardinals were behind. Two outs, two strikes, and then someone would come up. At the very last second, they'd tie the game up, and it went on the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th inning. And then at the bottom of the 11th, it was just historic. David Fries came up, and he hits this long, towering home run out to center field. The place went crazy. Now, I've been in a lot of baseball games, and I can tell you I've never been there when the stadium literally shook. It did. Everybody was jumping up and down. It was vibrating with celebration. I'd never felt that before. My wife and I were sitting on the, the second level, and behind us were some of those, those party boxes, and there was a huge TV blaring there. And, and just as that home run landed in center field, the announcer, Joe Buck, said this one line. And you can go back and listen to this. It shows on the 125th video. You can go back to YouTube and see this. But what he said was this. He said, see you tomorrow night. And that was it. He ended his broadcast. That one line, see you tomorrow night. As I got to thinking about what else could be said. The Cardinals had robbed the Texas Rangers numerous times of a victory. And, of course, we know the Cardinals won game seven. But when I heard that line, something clicked inside of me, see you tomorrow. And I realized that had actually been the mantra of my whole life. That that line, see you tomorrow, summed up my faith, my Christian journey. Let me share some of the ups and downs of my journey. 
My first two years in seminary were not very historic. In fact, they were almost disastrous. I found out after four weeks into my fourth semester that actually I'd been put on academic probation, but they forgot to tell me about it until four weeks in. I, and, and you'd have to understand at the school that time, there was a lot of internal stuff going on that really had nothing to do with the students, and we didn't know this till a few years later, but out of the 30 of us that started that year, there were only 10 of us that ever graduated anywhere from seminary, so you can see the turmoil the school was in. I was oblivious to it. I just knew I wasn't getting the education, so I transferred out to our Methodist school out in Kansas City. I, I began to struggle at that point. I, I, was, I felt I was called into ministry, but things in education weren't working out so well. It was the first time I had had any academic difficulty. Now, at St. Paul, after my first quarter, you had to go in, you had to write a 20-page paper, and then you went to what they called the orals. It was two of the toughest teachers, including an ethics professor whose joy, greatest joy in life was failing students. It really was. I never saw somebody have so much fun failing students. I went in scared to death. But I made up my mind that even though I felt like a few years ago God had called me into Christian ministry, into the, the pastoral work, that if I failed this test, I was out. I was out of the ministry business. I'd go back in to the business field. So I submitted my credo. I walked across campus, and as I was getting ready to walk in the, the building, out came through the steps and through the door my friend Fred. Fred had just had his orals. And as Fred came through the door, I made the mistake of saying, how did it go? And he says, Ed, it went great. He said, I'm so happy. And then Fred said the absolute worst thing that anybody could have said to me that morning. He said, Ed, guess what I heard? Only 10 out of 33 passed their, their orals. 23 have to rewrite the ethics part of their paper. Now, can you imagine giving the, my background how I felt going in that room, scared to death. I go into the room, and there are two members of our conference board of ordained ministry, the two professors and another professor I did not know. They could ask me anything or everything in my paper or whatever they wanted to ask me. They could ask me who I voted for. I mean, you had to bear everything you wanted to. I got in the room, and the, the, uh, my theology professor started out and asked me a question. And I said, uh, I answered, and he said, well, I, th I thought that's kind of what you meant. You probably need to change that a little bit and, and, and say this instead of that. I said, okay. I look over, and there's the ethics professor staring at me. And I thought, oh, here it comes. And again, I'm just scared to death. And then he said to me, he said, well, I didn't find anything wrong with your paper. And I just stared at him, waiting for the other shoe to drop. And he says, you passed, you got an A. My theology professor knew I was scared to death, and he says, yeah, he says, you need to know, Ed, just don't worry about it. She says, but you've passed, and you got an A on your paper. Don't worry about it. So this was two minutes into a 90-minute interview, and I thought, well, I can't go much wrong right now. But what became an oral examination, it became a healing and, and transforming a process for me. Because Bill Lee, my theology professor, looked at me and says, Ed, we got a couple questions for you. And I thought, well, that's why I'm there. And he says, I want to share a part of a letter that was written by the school when you transferred your, your uh, credentials over to us. And I said, okay. And he says, Ed, there was a line here we didn't understand. It said that the, the dean of students said that Ed Weston was unfit for ministry. Wow. Wow. He says, now, we don't understand this. He said, your work's been good, your class participation. And, and what happened over the next almost uh, 88 minutes was a healing and a reaffirmation of my call into ministry. And it was a very positive thing. And, and again, other than the first two minutes, they never asked me another question, which I was relieved about, about my paper. And at the very end, after they talked, and, and they asked me what had happened and how I was doing, and, and it was a reaffirming part of my call to ministry. God was speaking through them, telling me that I was supposed to be in the ministry. Now, I'm sure over the past 43, 44 years, there's been a few people and probably a district superintendent that's wondered if I was fit for the ministry. But I'll never forget what Bill Lee said to me that day. He looked at me and he said, Ed, we'll see you in class tomorrow. 
And I remembered that years and years later. See you in class tomorrow. It was a reaffirmation of my call to ministry. He said, Ed, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Stay with it. I realized that my feet were planted in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That nothing, nothing, not even a school going through turmoil, would separate me from the love of God. See you tomorrow. I was in the sixth year of my ministry at Belleville Union, church I retired from. We completed a renovation of a 12,000 square foot building and we connected it with our main building. Then August 4th, 2002, I had been at church that morning, went home. My wife and I were in the backyard. I had a pair of cut-off shorts and a lousy T-shirt on because it was hot outside. I received a call that the church was on fire. I jumped in the car, and the closer I got on Lebanon Avenue, you could see the black smoke just pouring out of that direction of the church. I got there, and I watched as, watched as the newest addition was destroyed by arson. It was heartbreaking. The main building was flooded by water and by smoke. My, my personal office was destroyed. I lost 30 years of my library and my sermons. And the standard joke at the church for quite a while was that's where the fire was the hottest. It was where my sermons were. My office, they said burn. And I figured it was because they wanted to make sure I never used those sermons again. But as I left the smoldering building about 10 o'clock on Sunday evening, we had all the major news stations from St. Louis. I was interviewed on TV. I, I'm sure I looked great, uh, hot and sweaty, and a T-shirt and a pair of shorts on. And, uh, but as I was leaving, one more reporter came up to me in the video camera behind her, and, and she says, well, what are you going to do tomorrow? Wow. I told her I was coming to work. I said, even though my office was destroyed and the, we weren't able to get back in the building and we didn't know it'd be how long it would be, I said I was going to show up and I was going to figure out our next step. And then in a moment of inspiration that only the Holy Spirit could have given me, I, I said this on TV. It wasn't what they wanted to hear, but it's what I said, and it did get published. I said, you know, evil may have destroyed our offices and damaged our sanctuary and our educational building, but I want you to know evil has not touched the church. I said the body of Christ, of union, was alive and that we just needed to get together and worship. I said the fire on Sunday would not stop our church on Monday. You see, I believed in that sign. See you tomorrow. You see, I'm standing firm in God's grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. See, nothing, not even arson, not even a fire, nothing can separate us from God's love. Over eight years ago, my father took ill on his 87th birthday. We were at the house to celebrate his birthday. My wife's a nurse and knew he wasn't feeling very well and convinced him to go to the hospital. I rode with him in the ambulance. He was very ill and he was put into the ICU unit immediately. Our family gathered and since I can sleep anywhere, I offered to spend the Saturday night with him. The rest of the family went home. I went in at 6.30 the next morning. I told my father goodbye. My mom and my brother had come up and that I had to head back to church. It was Sunday. I told my dad that I would be back later in the afternoon. And he said, which was typical of my dad, he says, hey, look, I know you're busy. It's your work day, which was a standard joke in our family. You know, I just pastor. I just worked that one hour on Sunday morning. You know how that is. He said, I know you're worried, and if you can't come today, don't worry. Just come back tomorrow. And I left. Got to church, went home, got cleaned up, and got to church. And 10 minutes before the worship service was to begin, I received a phone call on my cell phone from my brother. He said, we need to get back to the hospital immediately. It just happened that Sunday our associate pastor was preaching. So I handed my notes about the bulletin and the worship and the announcements, and I I said, you're on, I'm leaving. My wife was pulling up in the parking lot at the time. I happened to call her cell phone, and I said, don't park, come get me. So we rushed down to the Grand City Hospital about 30 minutes away, but it was too late. Dad had peacefully passed into the presence of God. We all went in there waiting for Nancy and I. We went in and we said goodbye. We had prayer with the family around my dad's uh, bedside. And as I got ready to leave, I told him that I would see him tomorrow. 
See you tomorrow, Dad. You see, that is the hope we all have. See you tomorrow. This world will never defeat God. Death never has the last word. Nothing can separate us from God's love. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. I shared with you I retired just about a year ago, well, a year ago technically last Sunday. Three weeks after I retired and three weeks into my new position as direct development, I went for my annual checkup to uh, the urologist. I had had kidney stones five, actually six years ago, and uh, passed them, thank goodness. And, but the doctor has me come in every year for an exam. Well, I made up my mind that I wasn't going back anymore. So what I did was I didn't take my little pastor's pocket calendar with me because I'd always make my appointment for the next year because I figured, well, I wouldn't quite be lying. I would just go up and say, well, I don't have my calendar with you. I'll call you later, okay? Well, that was a pretty good move on my part, okay? I'm not as dumb as I look. So it was a good move, except, except I went in for my exam that day, and he said, Ed, something's not right. And they brought me back three weeks later for biopsy, and a week after that, I got the news. I had cancer. It scared me to death. I had cancer. I didn't know that was not something that had not been a part of our family's medical history. And so my wife and I, we went to the urologist. He explained some processes. Then he sent us to a surgeon, and they did the robotic surgery on me And on August 26th. In fact, it was a few days, I think, after I was up here. I did a workshop in your church when you were getting your new roof on. That was an interesting day with the pounding of the roof. And we ended up going over there because I was doing a presentation to district pastors. But the bottom line was that, that here it was a few weeks after my retirement and, and my new career, and I'm hit over the head with the fact that I've got cancer. I was in the hospital just one night, went home. My wife hid my car keys because the doctor said don't drive anywhere for a week. And I would have. I don't sit at home very well, folks. But on Wednesday night, five days after my surgery, my surgeon calls me himself. Remember, clears the bell at 4.30 in the afternoon. He calls me himself, and he says, Ed, he said, we need to talk. And I said, yeah. He says, well, he says, I didn't want to wait till tomorrow. I had my follow-up appointment the very next morning. And he said, I, I just got to tell you, he says, the, the cancer was in, encapsulated. I think I've got the right word. He said, we removed it all. He said, we checked the lymph nodes. They checked everything else. I don't know what they did. I was out four and a half hours for surgery. I don't know what they did. Didn't care. Didn't feel anything. But he said, Ed, I need to tell you the cancer's gone. It's all gone. You're healed. And I said, well, what does that mean? Do I have to have, he says, Ed, nothing. You don't have to have any kind of treatment, radiation, chemo, nothing. He says, you're healed. You're cured. And then he said those magical words to me, great words of faith and hope. He said, I'll see you tomorrow. You see, I knew my life had been changed again. See you tomorrow. I was cancer-free, and I'm cancer-free today. How, how grateful I am to God for his healing power. How grateful I am to that surgeon and to the medical staff that took care of me. What turned out to be a real negative has turned into a very positive thing because I know that nothing can separate me from God's love. And then I look at the cross, and I, I think back about how Jesus was falsely accused. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was forced to lug this huge instrument of death throughout the streets. Then he was nailed to the cross. Then he was lifted up. What a horrible way to die. But Jesus did it because of God's grace, because of God's love for his people, because of God's love for me. And there on the cross, his very last statement was, it is finished. Scripture tells us he bowed his head and died. Jesus said, it is finished. Notice that he did not say, I am finished. He did not say, I am retiring. Jesus said, it is finished. What was he talking about? He was saying, death is is overcome. Sin has been redeemed. Salvation is not possible for every person. You see, I think Jesus was saying from the cross, when he said, it is finished, he was saying, see you tomorrow. 
For that's the good news we celebrate at Easter every year. At Easter, Jesus rose from the grave and he lives forevermore. See you tomorrow is God's loud shout throughout history. See you tomorrow. For this world belongs to God. This church belongs to God. I belong to God and I stand in his grace. See you tomorrow. You see, tomorrow is God's kingdom. Tomorrow is where God always is. Tomorrow is where God is waiting for me. I stand in his grace. Nothing can separate me from God's love. For you see, tomorrow is where God lives. See you tomorrow. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we again thank you for your presence with us. For those times when you've walked through the dark valleys of life. For those times when you've carried us when life is just so rough. Those times when you stood beside us at the graveside of a loved one. For those times that you have celebrated life with us and given us so many blessings. Lord, we, we thank you for everything you've done. But most of all, we thank you for your love that was manifested in your son, Jesus Christ who is willing to die on a cross that each one of us might have a new tomorrow. So today we are filled with praise and gratefulness for all that you have done and for all that you will do. Remind us, O oh God, that even when we pass through the doors of death, that there you will be with us, giving us a new tomorrow. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.